Okay, everybody. Good evening. Um, yeah, I'm assuming the sound is okay, yeah? All right. So, yeah, fine. Okay, so, um, tonight we are going to do a, what is called, um, the Parsha, Parski Teitzei. Uh, every week we read a certain section of the Torah, a certain portion. Tonight's portion comes in the section, the section is called Kitetze, when you go out to war. Now this uh, section that we're going to read is kind of startling in its, um, uh, in, in, in what it allows and what it, um, kind of what it says, and we have to put it in context, which I'll do in a minute. Let's just read the verses which I'll translate, and then um, we'll discuss and try and understand what's going on. So, um, the verses begin like this, When you go out to war against your enemies, and God gives them into your hand, and you capture their captives. You take captives, in other words. Raisa Bishivya, and when you see amongst the captives, Aishis Yafas Tor, a woman who is beautiful, a beautiful woman, and you desire her, and you can take you can you may take her for a wife. Then it goes on to say about how you have to bring her to your home and uh, basically get her to remove all her uh, makeup and uh, so on and so forth and her fancy clothing because the women used to go out when the men went out to war they would uh, sort of encourage the men their men the men on their side by going out in fancy clothing and promising the spoils of war if they won and so on and so forth um and she has to stay in your house uh for a month before you can actually take her as a wife. You're not allowed to have any relations with her or anything like that before a month is up. Now, in today's world, this is kind of a uh, very confusing and somewhat startling uh, situation. Uh, you know, going out and taking captives, basically uh, capturing women, although that wasn't the purpose of the uh, the war, but capturing, capturing women and then um, forcing them to marry you sounds kind of familiar uh, from um, ISIS and so on and so forth. And so what's going on here? What is the Torah talking about? <clears throat> How does it allow such a thing? So just in a very simple sense, we have to understand the historical context of this. And the historical context was that um, slavery and capturing women from the enemy was just absolutely common practice that's what you did like there was no question about it uh, you know you know you enslaved people and then you uh you could um, take captives and um do what you wanted with them including marry, marrying marrying uh, the women and uh, enslaving the men and children and so on and so forth and that was reality so what the torah is talking about how we are first of all is that this what we're mentioning over here is not a war which is obligatory. This is not an obligatory war. This is a war which, if you have to, if you want to fight such a war to conquer extra territory, you're allowed to. And these are conditions, these are some of the conditions of war. One of the conditions is that you're allowed to take captives. And amongst the captives, this is women, you can, you can even marry the captive. However, there's many restrictions on what you can actually do with this, uh, with this woman once you have uh, married her. I'll explain this all in a, in a deeper sense later on. Um, one of the strict restrictions is, again, that um, you're not allowed to touch her for a month. Uh, she sits and mourns for her family and for her household and for parents and so on and so forth for a month before you're allowed to even uh, have any um, relations, sexual relations with, uh, with this woman. Secondly, you actually have to marry her. It's not just uh, you can, uh, you know, just uh, rape and pillage. It's not allowed. Um, and thirdly, if you decide that you don't want her, 
you have to let her go free. You're not allowed to sell her as a slave. Um, and why? Because he caused her anguish by separating her from her family, from her land, and so on and so forth. So therefore, you have to let her go. And uh, that's basically some of the laws of this of the capturing of a woman, a beautiful woman who uh, you saw amongst the captives. Now let's dig a little bit deeper. Uh, first of all, obviously today, um, none of this, uh, none of this applies. Uh, this this concept of capturing um, women from our enemies and bringing them into the house and so on and so forth. We don't do this uh, today, but it was permitted to do. Says the uh, Talmud, it was permitted because of the Yetzirah, because a person, especially men at war, you know, the testosterone is uh, sky high. And um, if we don't allow men to do, to, to take this beautiful captive that, and, 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 and treat her properly as a wife and, and so on and so forth, if we don't allow it, then much worse things are going to happen. Uh, things like rape and pillaging and, uh, and, and, and slaughter and so on and so forth, which uh, are obviously um, far worse than capturing this woman and uh, sort of, yes, forcing her into um, a marriage that maybe she wouldn't have wanted, uh, ideally. But nevertheless, it's a marriage with certain, you know, with, with, with the responsibilities of the man towards his wife and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is, the, um, that is what the Talmud says. The Talmud says this is in order to prevent a person from doing far worse uh, sins than, um, than capturing this woman. So the Torah therefore allows, God therefore allows us to do such a thing, uh, even though it is not recommended certainly not highly recommended it's not recommended but if you do such a thing then these are the restrictions on such a relationship however along comes the Arizal Rabbi Yitzhak Luria the famous Kabbalist from Swat uh, 1500s and he asks a question well if that's the case if your blood is boiling and your testosterone is uh, at very elevated levels and you might do something far worse um, so that could apply to any of the commandments of the Torah. Why, why particularly this one? It could apply to any of the commandments. So he sort of kind of rejects, the, rejects this explanation to a certain extent. He rejects it. And he explains it um, in a much deeper fashion. What he says is as follows. He says the fact that a man is attracted to a woman even if she's a woman that is not from um, initially from his um, background, his religion, his people, and so on and so forth. The reason for that is because um, there must be some affinity between these souls. There's an affinity of the souls over here. There's an affinity of some, there's some spark of holiness in this woman that is attractive to attractive to him for one reason or another and then he got, he goes on to explain and that's why it says when you cap when you capture their captives the verse the verse states again when you go out to war against your enemies and god gives them into your hand and you capture their captives so the Arizal explains, what does it mean you capture their captives? It sounds like a double expression. He says, yes, indeed it is. You capture their captives. You capture those sparks of holiness which are in captivity in that nation that you just fought, fought against. In other words, there's sparks of holiness which are embedded in creation, which came to be embedded in creation because of the sin of Adam and Eve, of Adam and Chava, when they, um, um, uh, when, when they sinned with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So then uh, the entire spiritual world, all of the spiritual worlds, basically had a nephila. Actually, let me, let me restate that. 
the lower physical worlds went into a state of destruction and the higher spiritual worlds had a state of nephila. Nephila means falling, they fell down a level. The very highest spiritual worlds were not affected, but, uh, but the, the spiritual worlds with, with, with which we have and to which we have any recourse, which we have any connection with, those were affected in one, uh, affected in one way or another. So basically what happened was, sparks of holiness fell into unholy situations. So therefore, when it comes to a time of, uh, of war, this could be, says the Arizal, this could be a time really for the redemption of sparks of holiness that there are in that they are in captivity in the hands of your enemies. And therefore you're allowed to redeem those sparks by bringing them into your home, by bringing this woman, this beautiful woman, who, to whom you are attracted, into, maybe other men are not attracted to her, but you bring them into, you bring her into your home. And you make her part of your uh, part of your life. In other words, you incorporate that spark of holiness within your uh, within your daily activities, um, with the various restrictions that are mentioned. There has to be preparation, first of all, in order to um, uh, in order to bring her in, and so on and so forth. The Baal Shem Tov goes a stage even deeper. The Baal Shem Tov says like this, when you go out to war against your enemies, who's your greatest enemy? Your greatest enemy is not necessarily people outside of yourself. Your greatest enemy is really within yourself. The greatest enemy is within you. And when you go out to fight against that enemy, that enemy within, when you go out to fight against that enemy within, you may simply battle against the enemy and eventually win the battle. But winning the battle is not really um, the ultimate goal. Because winning the battle in the normal course of things, in the normal course of war, simply means that you have vanquished the enemy, you've subdued the enemy. But a much higher form of subduing the enemy is transforming the enemy. To transform the enemy, not uh, to transform the enemy essentially into a friend. Not only just a friend, but your closest friend. Who's your closest friend? Your closest friend is your wife. Yeah, for a man, his closest friend should be his wife. One of the uh, commentaries uh, when explaining the commandment of love your neighbor, your friend, your acquaintance as yourself. So the, um, one, one of the commentaries says that applies first and foremost to your wife. She's your closest neighbor. She's your closest neighbor. Says the Baal Shem Tov, um, when we're talking here about the wife, or um, as the sages put it, this is your, um, it is to appease your Yetzahara, your evil inclination, your inclination towards evil, your inclination towards self-indulgence, towards, uh, towards self-aggrandizement, uh, towards uh, self-satiation. So that battle is the battle that we all have. It's not a battle that necessarily has to be fought with weapons with swords and with uh, guns and with uh, cannons and so on and so forth. That is an internal battle against ourselves. It's a battle against the one within us who could really become our closest companion. In other words, the Yetzahara, the, uh, the, the inclination towards evil can actually become an inclination towards good. It can become an extremely positive force. There's this one of the uh, stories told about one of the great, uh, one of the great sages whose name is Resh Lakish or Rabbi Shimon Ben Lakish, Resh Lakish. 
Now, Rash Lakish, in his, uh, former, his former occupation, before he became a very, very great scholar, his occupation was that he was a highwayman. He was a, <laughs> a highway robber. And uh, he would lie in wait and, uh, and attack people when they came. And he, would, uh, he was the head of a whole group of, uh, a whole gang of, uh, of, uh, of highwaymen. And uh, he was a rough character. In any event, one day, one of the great sages, Rabbi Yochanan, um, wa- went to immerse himself in a river uh, for purification purposes, we assume. Uh, he went to purify himself in a river. And uh, he obviously took his clothes off and left them on the bank and uh, then went to immerse in the river. Well, Raj Lakis was hiding behind a tree. And uh, as soon as he saw that Rabbi Yochanan was safely in the river, he went and grabbed his clothing. Not because he needed the clothes, but I assume that he, uh, he had assumed that there was money in the pockets or whatever. And he would have a rich haul, you know, steal his wallet and his credit cards and so on and so forth. So uh, in any event, that's what, uh, that's what he did. He went and grabbed Rabbi Yochanan's claw. And Rabbi Yochanan, as soon as he saw him, and he put his head above the water, and he saw Reish Lakish making off with his clothes, he yelled out at him. Whatever he yelled, hey! And, um, and so when Reish Lakish saw that, he was, uh, that, he'd been, uh, that he'd been seen, he jumped, right over, he jumped right over this river from one bank to the other. Uh, Rabbi Yochan was in this bank and Reish Lakish jumped from this bank all the way over to the other side of the river to the other bank, which was apparently a, um, quite some feat because Rabbi Yochanan called out after him and he said, if you have such power in thievery, imagine what power you could have if you turn it to the good. And Reish Lakish stopped on the other side of the bank and he thought for a moment and no one had ever spoken to him like that, and he never, he never, never really crossed his mind that he could use his powers in a positive way. And he went back to Rabbi Yochanan, and he said to him, um, basically, you know, would you take someone like me as a student? And he said, I will. And in fact, he did. And to such an extent that Reish Lakish married his sister, married the sister of Rabbi Yochanan. And Rabbi Yochanan became his teacher. And Reish Lakish himself became a very, very great sage, one of the great sages of the Talmud. So we can see uh, this concept of um, enemies. Instead of just fighting an enemy and subduing the enemy, sort of Krav Maga kind of thing or whatever, it's subduing the enemy. If you can take the enemy, you can transform him into a friend, transform him into a companion, into a, uh, a colleague. How much more so is that better than, uh, than, than, simply, um, um, than simply subduing him? The Baal Shem Tov explains it a little bit more. It says as follows. There's really two ways of dealing with a thief. And it means in a general way, not necessarily uh, related to Rabbi uh, Shimon ben Lakish, Rash Lakish, but um, just in a general sense. One approach to dealing with a thief is when a thief comes to break in, you start shouting and screaming and making a big, a big hullabaloo, and uh, he'll probably get frightened and run away because he's frightened other people will come and see what's going on, and he'll get captured, and he runs away. That's one way of, uh, of dealing with a thief. Second way of dealing with a thief is actually catching him and then transforming him into a, uh, a good fellow. And that's really what we're talking about over here. Transforming those aspects of ourselves against which we generally have to fight Instead of fighting against them, and you probably noticed, if anyone, for example, um, I uh, did some studies of, uh, of addictions and, uh, and things like this, and uh, I'm sure there are people here on the, on the, uh, on the forum that can um, verify this and probably explain it much better than I do. In any event, um, you've probably noticed with people who have addictions that they have to really battle their addictions and the more and the more they fight the worse it gets the more the more the enemy the addiction or whatever it is um, fights back 
And we find that this is, uh, this is in fact true. Anyone who has ever tried to fight his inclination towards evil, inclination towards uh, negativity, inclination towards self-indulgence and so on and so forth, in one way or another, especially if it gets to the level of addiction, the harder you fight it, the worse it gets. I remember reading something in one of the um, um, Alcoholics Anonymous guidebooks where um, he says that, you know, when people try to white knuckle it, when they try and white knuckle, in other words, you know, grit your teeth and get over it kind of thing. He said, you'll never, you'll never win against that. You'll never win. It's, it's, it's just not the way to win. The way to win, uh, according to Alcoholics Anonymous, is uh, just give it up, right? Give it up. It's not your battle. It's God's battle. Put it in his hands. You, you, you I can't do this. Uh, you, you do it for me, or you, you fight the battle. So without going to that uh, aspect of it uh, too deeply right now, uh, that is definitely the way of uh, going about it, but that's what brings a person to a certain transformation. And that transformation is taking an enemy and making it into, or the wife of an enemy, making, making her into, making her into, a, into your wife. Um, meaning to say, taking that spark of holiness that there is embedded in things which seem to attract our souls into evil, into negative things, into um, negative behaviors, and dragging them out of the negative behavior and transforming them into a positive force. Just like Rabbi Yochanan said to Reish Lakish, that... Um, Imagine what you could be if you use that power that you have for good things, for study, for, for, for focus on, uh, on positive things. And that, in fact, is what the battle is all about. And therefore, there's a sort of a, sort of a promise implicit in this battle. Again, let's look at the words, the words of the, uh, of the verse begin as follows. When you go to war above, literally above your enemies, it's usually translated as, as on your enemies or against your enemies. Uh, if anyone wants to look it up, look it up this is in uh, Deuteronomy 21.10. 21.10 following, 10.11, and so on, 12, uh, 13, and so on. So... Um, the idea here is that when you go out to battle, go out to battle not as an equal opposite force trying to vanquish and overcome the enemy, but go against the enemy in a way that you are above your enemy. Go above your enemy. In other words, the battle, if you battle your enemies on their terms, it's a 50-50 chance that you're going to win. Uh, and it might be less than 50-50. Uh, it might be a lot less. Why? Because we know that uh, when it comes to physical battling, the blessings of physical warfare were not given to Jacob. They were given to Esau, to Esau. Hayadayim yaday Esau the hands of the hands of Esau, and he was given the blessing, you shall live by your sword. Whereas Jacob was given the blessing, the voice is the voice of Jacob. The battle that Jacob has to fight is the battle of study and the battle of prayer. Therefore, the Baal Shem Tov actually points out that this war is prime, I'm sorry, not the Baal Shem Tov, it's from the Zohar originally. The Zohar originally points out that this war is the war you fight against yourself at the time of prayer, during prayer. When you go out to war against your enemies, um, that is a time of that's the time of prayer. That's the time of study. That's when you're going to be able to capture your enemies and transform them into uh, good. Again, your enemies are internal forces and not only necessarily external forces. The truth is that the external enemies that we have are merely 
being fed, being nourished by the internal enemies that we have. And therefore, someone who is regarded as a tzaddik, as a righteous person, someone who has overcome already, he doesn't have this battle anymore, would not be attracted towards an Asia Sifator, a woman who is uh, regarded as beautiful. And in fact, the, um, the sages said, and um, uh, this is actually it's based on verses, that people who would, the men who would go out to war, would be encouraged to stay home if they were not tzaddikim, if they were not sure of their own righteousness. If they were not sure that they were righteous people, it may have been better for them to stay home. And uh, so we're talking about people who are going out into battle that are people who want the right thing. They may still be, able to still be fighting. They may still be battling against themselves. But um, they certainly want to overcome the negative qualities in order to elevate themselves above their enemies. So that the enemy is no longer a... Uh, a, a physical enemy, the primary enemy is the enemy that we battle against in a spiritual sense. And that's where um, the Jewish people, to a certain extent, have supremacy uh, in, that, in the spiritual battle because we have been given guidance uh, in the Torah and in uh, Kabbalah in particular uh, about how to, um, how to fight this war on a spiritual plane Therefore, hopefully, we won't have to fight the wars at all on a physical plane. And uh, to a very large extent, that is, in fact, um, what has happened historically um, and certainly is said to, 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 to will, that will come about in the future when, um, when people are sort of more righteous and more involved in prayer and in, uh, and in Torah study and so on, they don't have to fight uh, physical battles. And, and in the future, the battle against the enemy, the Armageddon, you know, Armageddon that uh, everybody talks about, Armageddon and so on, that Armageddon is not fought on a spirit, on a physical plane. It will be fought, hopefully, it will be fought on a spiritual plane. And uh, that is far easier for us to win because we have much more of a natural affinity for that kind of battle rather than actually going out with uh, you know, tanks and airplanes and, uh, and uh, machine guns and bombs and swords and <laughs> whatever. Um, and that's the way it is. So that's the war. And hopefully... Uh, when we do have to go out to war, uh, whatever war it may happen to be, we'll be all over, we'll be upon our enemies, above our enemies, that um, they will not be able to harm us. The story is told of the famous sage Rashi, that um, the um, king of France at that time, the monarch, I don't remember who it was, the monarch of France wanted to do, um, do some harm to the great sage Rashi. Rashi lived in the 1300s. And he secretly went to his uh, Beit Midrash, to his um, study hall. And he searched for him, and he couldn't find him. Um, but Rashi was there the entire time, just that he couldn't see him. Um, how that exactly happens, I don't know, but... Um, but that's what happened. Rashi was there and he couldn't be seen. He could see but not be seen. And um, he wasn't hiding. He wasn't in hiding. He was sort of sitting in his desk. But he just simply was not visible to the people who were looking for him. Uh, I guess because they were looking on the physical plane and he was already in a, on a transcendent physical plane, uh, a spiritual plane or other, rather. He was basically filled with light, I suppose, so they can you know, look right through him kind of thing. Uh, again, how this works in uh, you know in the physical world, don't ask me. Um, but it certainly is true in a spiritual context. Okay, any questions? Any questions?